I actually am going to give you the Reader's Digest version of my, my story. Uh, I'd like to introduce myself. I am Mitch Robinson and I am an alcohol drug addict. Um, my sobriety date is uh, October 21st, 1990, and I have a sponsor, his name is Jeff H. And for those things, I'm eternally grateful. Um, I have, and I've already talked to the sheriff, I have immunity from this, what I'm going to tell you. I have done heroin, I've done crack cocaine, I have done, we call it free base because it was a while ago. I have done crystal methamphetamine, I have done LSD, I have done everything, but it started at 12 years old with alcohol. And it really started at an earlier age with feelings of fear and insecurity, of not fitting in to be, you know, just scared to death to be able to, you know, I, was, I had um, somebody from South Pacific was a, a play that was put on in the 70s here. Because I remember sitting out here and just wanting so desperately to be on that stage, but terrified that if I got up there, I would fail. And, uh, you know, I just got to ask you, this is just for, 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 to make a point. Can I see a show of hands of who has made, who's, who's drank alcohol in here? At least once, okay? Everybody raised their hand almost, except you young people, and I did, you can't let mom and dad know. <laughs> you know, I suffer from the disease of addiction. You all chose to do the same alcohol I chose to do. But because of dopamine, dopamines and all this other science stuff that I really don't understand, my brain reacted differently to it. And one was never enough. I wanted another one. Because you see, for that brief moment, that drug, that alcohol made me feel normal, made me feel happy, made me feel accepted. And if one was good, two was better, and if two was better, a case was probably going to do it. I, I drank my first beer the first time that I planned to drink at 12 years old. I was on a hunting trip with my parents, or my dad and, and some of his buddies in Montana. Now just so you know, I came from some of you, the parents in here, I know one of them in here, that uh, I was probably one of the children that he was, um, that gave him and his son fits. Some of you I went to school with. But at 12 years old, I took my first drink. And when I took my first drink, I got drunk, I made a fool out of myself, and I blacked out. I did that for the next 18 years. The only difference was, was I put other things in them. My last drunk, in August of 1990, um, lasted for nine days. I don't remember it. I know I acted a fool because people told me. And I woke up from every one of those filled with guilt, shame, and remorse. I'm not asking for your sympathy for my disease. I'm really not. Because in the 26 years that I've been clean and sober, I've learned to enjoy life. If life isn't going to be fun, I don't want any part of it. If we're not having fun, I'm not with you. Okay? If you want to be miserable, that's fine. But you're going to do it by yourself. I learned uh, at that time when I got drunk at 12, my dad, it was the first time I felt like he accepted me. Now, you know, for us boys especially, a father's acceptance is a big thing. My granddaddy always accepted me, but I didn't have granddad all the time. I had my dad, and he had a different role than granddad, and a friend of mine has, has done some really good work on this, and I agree with him. But that was the first time I, I, that my dad was proud of me. And the next day I shot a deer. So I learned two things. That if I kill things and get drunk, my dad will approve of me. So I kept trying to kill things and get drunk. But I couldn't kill animals because that hurt me. It really made me sad to feel that way. You know? Um, it's horrible to have that monster inside of you that doesn't want to do the things that we do or I did. But you know, if it made me feel different about the way I was, some of you that are in here that might have been in school with me, I was always joking around. And the reason I was always joking around was because I wanted to control when you laughed. See, I was always terrified that if you were laughing, it was because of something I did. So I was so paranoid. But yet I came across as an egomaniac, filled with all kinds of fear about who you were. And the drugs and the alcohol covered that and made me feel okay. 
Now it progressed to where um, I left here in 1983 and went to Kentucky, and I don't know if you all can tell, but I do talk a little funny to maybe y'all, but not to me. Um, but, but I went down there, and, and I've been married twice down there, and I'm married again up here. And I want to thank some people real, real quick. I want to thank my wife, Julie, for putting this together. This is her brainchild. And, and without her, this was And I want to thank uh, uh, Todd and Beaver River for allowing us this facility, this beautiful facility to come together as a community, which is what the school should be about, as a community coming together. It used to be that way, but it's not anymore. And I want to thank Todd and Beaver River for that. Um, because without that, we wouldn't have this. But when, when I was in Kentucky, um, I moved to Evansville, Indiana, and I got married to a lady, and I had two beautiful children. In the last six months of my drinking, is the only time, oh, and I work. I've had a job since I was 13 years old. I worked in resorts um, as a cook, and uh, the chef was always mad because when he'd go in to get the whipped cream, they were always flat. And he never knew why a whole case of whipped cream came in flat. Because we were doing whippets. So I've done those too. But the last six months of my using, I put a loaded gun in my mouth every night. I had a uh, brand new baby girl and a two year old baby boy in a home, and I couldn't live anymore. I couldn't go on the way I was going on, and I didn't know what to do. See, I, I grew up in a family with an alcoholic. My mom was an alcoholic, and I can say that because she went to Augensburg and got treatment, but she just never chose to get this program. And I watched my mother put morphine and alcohol in a feeding tube because she lost her, her tongue, bottom of her mouth from cancer from her drinking to get the high she needed. It's powerful, folks. She didn't want to live that way. No more than I wanted to live that way. No more than the heroin addict really wants to live that way. They just don't know there's another way. I didn't. I didn't have a clue. And I wanted to die to get out of that way of living. And on October 21st, 1990, I was driving down the highway and I cried out to God and I said, God, either kill me or change me. I can't do this anymore. And he spoke to me and changed my life. And two and a half years later, I got custody of my two kids. And I became the director of operations for treatment centers for teenagers in the state of Kentucky, three of them. And I did interventions all over the East Coast on teenagers. And I'm a single dad raising my kids. And I know what I'm looking for. And I'm a good dad. And I'm there all the time. And don't you know I got the phone call? that my kid had done something wrong. So if you're sitting there thinking you're the perfect parent, it won't happen to your family, you're watching, get your head out of the sand, folks. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but don't let it happen because you think you've got the perfect family. Check on your kids. Check on your spouses. Love them. And if somebody has an addiction, or has an alcohol. And alcohol is our biggest problem we had in Lewis County, folks. I'm here to tell you right now. But it's okay because I can go to the nice and easy and get it. I can't go there and get my hair on. But I can go to the nice and easy and get a 30-pack and come out and go home and be drunk and abuse my kids and abuse my wife. And nobody says anything about that. See, we had that secret in our family that, that Erica talked about. The funny part was, in my family, the whole town knew about our drinking problem. But I lived in that isolation. But because somebody cared for me and somebody shared with me their hope, I'm here today standing before you telling you there is a better way if you have somebody in your family to live. And sometimes you just got to get away from them. You know, my dad almost loved me to death. I'd break the law. I, I, I was telling the sheriff I rode in the front seat of the sheriff's car because they didn't want me throwing up in the back seat. <laughs> and I told him I paid for it. I'm not throwing it up. 
And I, I, for the record, I only blew a 2 5, so I wasn't that drunk. <laughs> I never paid a consequence because my dad got a lawyer. My dad bailed me out. My dad, dad paid my fine. Every time I got in trouble, my dad was right there to me. And he did it because that's what we think love is. Sometimes we got to say, oh, you're in jail, good, you're safe. They'll let you out soon. Sometimes we have to say, oh, your car insurance is $300 a month because you got a DWI? Well, you probably need a better job. Because, you see, I never suffered any consequences for my behavior. I never had to look at my behavior until it was so painful that even I couldn't avoid it. You all knew my behavior just by looking at me. My wives knew about it because they loved me. But see, I didn't know about it because there was no consequence. You all were my problem. I was never my problem. If you all just leave me alone, don't pick on me, I'm going to be okay. But I want to share with you what happens at the end of the story. I'm a, a single dad raised two kids. I, I'm an ordained Southern Baptist preacher. You tell me God doesn't have a sense of humor. Yeah. Okay? Hey, if it doesn't amaze you, it amazes me, okay? I got to marry both of my children. No, it was in Kentucky. I didn't marry them. I got to do the service, okay? And by the way, you can marry your first cousin in New York. You can't in Kentucky, so I don't know about the siblings. So. But, but I got to be there for my kids because somebody gave me a helping hand. Somebody told me the truth when the truth hurt. See, and I know who my true friends are today because they tell me the truth knowing that it's going to hurt my feelings. They tell me the truth because they love me and don't want to tell me the lie that's going to kill me. Y'all got loved ones out there, husbands, wives, children, grandparents, whatever. There's help and there's hope. If they don't get it, you can get better. Because as you heard from Erica's story, I affected everybody around me. Didn't think I was doing that at all. If you're one of those being affected from running, talk to Erica. If she gets it. Talk to somebody else. They get it. You're not alone anymore. And we're not going to solve this problem ourselves. I was told by somebody that we need to be patient. That's just cold word for complacency and for not doing things. Okay? When you get the phone call, and I received this phone call from a 12-year-old uh, little girl. Her mom was a member of my church. And she, mom had, or grandma rather, was a member of my church. Grandma had custody because mom just couldn't get her life together. Saturday night, 9 30, 10 o'clock at night, my phone rings. And little Maddie's on the phone. I said, What's up, sweetheart? She said, I need you to pray for me and grandma. I said, Okay, what's going on? We came over to check on mom. We found her with a needle in her arm. She's dead. When you get that phone call from somebody you love, Patience ain't going to be the word you wanted to hear. As Erica said, it's better to go through your kid's room and find evidence that nothing's going on than to go through the room later on and find out, oh, my Lord, this was all in here. Because, see, if my mom had gone through my room, she'd have found pot. If she looked real good, she'd found LSD. Probably found some cocaine from time to time. She didn't have to look for the alcohol because that was in their cabinet. See, that was okay for us to do but you see, if they had gone through my room, they'd have found these things. But when you live in a family that's sick, like my family was, and I love my family to death, I'm not blaming them. It's hard for somebody who has to get up in the middle of the night to stop the shakes to look at her son and say, boy, you got a problem. See, so oftentimes with, with us, we don't want to look at somebody else because then we've got to look at ourselves. See, and I had to take a real hard look at Mitch Robinson. And because I did, I can stand before you tonight grateful that I am a drug addict and an alcoholic. Grateful that I've been through everything I've been through. Because there's somebody in this world that my story is going to change their life. And all that pain and all that heartache that I went through is worth it if 
one person comes up to me at any point and says, man, you helped me. Because, see, I had that one person. And my wife got to hear his voice on the phone the other day. He was a counselor at my treatment center. And uh, because I was such a good study, he is now the deputy commissioner of the uh, corrections for the state of Kentucky in charge of all their substance abuse program. I trained him that well. <laughs> and it only took me 30 days to train him that well. But you know, he was talking, we were talking about how much hope he gave me that one day. And how much I no longer felt alone. I always thought I was alone. I knew y'all were drunk, but I didn't know you felt like I did. And I found that. Now, I don't know what happened to my dopamines and all that other stuff. Now, my wife will tell you I act like a 13-year-old or 12-year-old or an 8-year-old sometimes. But I'm here to have fun in life. So I'm subject to act like a 3-year-old. But I'm going to have fun doing it. And I'm not going to hurt you doing it. I'm just going to act goofy. I want to touch on one thing real quick, and then I'm going to let you go because it is past time. I had surgery, um, I don't know, 15 years ago maybe. And I had uh, 50 stitches and 27 staples in my neck and around my ear where I had a, a tumor or a uh, cyst removed. And if you're in the medical community and I step on your toes, I'm sorry, I don't mean this, but this is just, this is how little we know. The doctor hands me a prescription, and I tell every doctor, dentist, anybody I go to in the medical community that I am in recovery and I have an allergy to narcotics. I cannot take any narcotics at all. He hands me a prescription for 30 Loratab, 10 milligram, with three refills. Well, now the added thing is, what the hell? Hello. <laughs> now, I've been sober probably for, I don't know, 10, 12, 14 years at the time. And I looked at it and I handed it back to him. I said, I can't take that. And he said, you got to take it. He said, you're going to have a lot of pain. I said, no, I can't take it. Back and forth three times. Finally, I looked at it and I said, Doc, let me ask you a question. Is the pain that I'm going to have going to be able to kill me? And he kind of laughed. He said, well, absolutely, it can't kill you. No, it's not going to kill you. I said, well, these pills can. I told you I'm in recovery. I can't take these pills. The medical community doesn't even understand the disease concept of it. They want to think we're weak-minded, too. They want to think we're... Look, the addict needs our love, folks, not our hate. The dope man needs our hate. The dope man's the one we need to be angry at, not the loved one that's gotten hooked into it. Because y'all took that same beer that I took, it just led me to the heroin. It just led me to the cocaine. It didn't lead you to it. You were able to put it down. I couldn't. So if our loved ones are honest, we need to love them back to rightness. And sometimes it's tough love. Sometimes it's no is the best word you can say to them. But if you want to get angry at somebody, get angry at the dope man. Well, what do we do about the dope man? You know, look, if you've got a neighbor that 20 cars are coming in and out of there all the time, and they're not running a business, probably something going on, it'd be worth a call to the sheriff's department and say, hey, look, there's some activity going on in my neighbor's house. Don't know what it means, but it's not normal. they got a new mean dog that's out front all the time. And if you're afraid to call, call me and I'll call for you. Because I'm done burying people. And it, it, we can't do this anymore, folks. I, 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 there's nothing worse than looking in the eyes of a parent of a child who has overdosed and to see the pain. It's bad enough when we're out there, but when there is no hope, to see as long as that, that dope means alive, there's hope that they'll change. But the moment they quit breathing, there's no more hope for them to change. I thank God I didn't pull the trigger on that pistol all those times. Thank you for coming out here tonight and listening to the people. I hope that the information that you got was helpful. We're going to go into the cafeteria. I know it's late, 
but we're going to hang. we got coffee and hot chocolate and stuff and cookies. Please take the cookies. My wife will make me take them home. Like I said, I am an addict and I will eat them. There's some peanut butter ones in there that I know are good. But ask questions. Talk to each other. Talk to the experts. I'm not an expert. I'm not the answer to the questions that are going on in this community. Neither is the sheriff, neither is Bob, neither is Mountain View, neither is Credo. But we are pieces to the answer. And we got to work together. The churches are part of the answer. You know what? You won't believe this. The Mennonite church has a drinking problem in it in some places. The Catholic Church has a drug problem in some places. The Southern Baptist Church had it, and we don't drink. It's everywhere, folks. It doesn't care if you're tall, walk short, rich, poor. Doesn't matter how good your parents were to you. We've got a classic example of that. If you get it, you got it. As a friend of mine used to say, I don't know where I got the disease, but all I know is I got it back. But there's a cure for it, and that's abstinence. So if you would join me in in the uh, uh, in, in, in the, the cafeteria, I've got some cards. Like I said, you can have my number. Sheriff will give you his number. Got questions? Ask him. I would like to ask, and I know we're in a school, but I, I've got a friend here who is a is a pastor, and I would like to ask him if he would close us in a prayer because my belief. And you can take this for what it's worth, but my belief is we ain't gonna do nothing without God leading us. Hey, nothing. <laughs> and it's one of the first things we took out of our schools, yeah. Wonder why we got problems. I took him out of my life, I wonder why I got problems. The only prayer I ever asked him was God kill me tonight when he did not be mad at me. So if, if I could, Paul, if you could close us in a prayer for our community, I would really appreciate that. And then, I know it's late again, but I'm going to feed the cookies. This is why you need to be careful of who you become friends with. <laughs> well, I thank Mitch and each person I shared tonight. Um, it was very informational for even me as a pastor, and I think for everybody else sitting here. And uh, let's just bow forward a prayer for you. Our Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this evening, Lord. I thank you for each individual who took the time to come tonight, Lord, and to sit in this meeting. Lord, I thank you for the people who shared. Lord, I pray for us as a community. Lord, not that uh, it was shared tonight that we look at people with hatred, Lord, but we look at people with love. And that if we all work together, we can make our community a better place. I thank you for the school being willing to open this up for us this evening. Lord, I thank you for those who took part in making us the goodies and the coffee and so on tonight, Lord, I thank you for the fellowship that we're going to have, and I thank you, and I just pray a blessing on our law enforcement and the people who are working with this uh, drug addiction in our area, that you will continue to bless them, Lord, as they put their lives on the line at times to keep us safe, Lord, I'm so thankful for them and what they do. In your precious name, amen. amen.